Hello, everybody, and welcome. Hello, hello, some nice familiar faces in there. Uh, so as we have this sort of waterfall of people joining us, um, we're just going to get started uh, in the interest of uh, keeping everybody's time on the Zoom and computers um, to what we're here for. So my name is Jade. Uh, I'm part of the team at Canada's uh, nonprofit outdoor learning store, um, and we are a charitable social enterprise that offers outdoor learning equipment and resources for educators and learners, uh, and we support Canadian outdoor learning nonprofit organizations. I'm uh, here joining you from the traditional and unceded territories of the Sinaiaks, the Okanagan Silks, the Tanaha, and the Shwemet people. Uh, may truth and reconciliation come to all. So we know that in the context of outdoor learning, it's really fundamental to help develop your understanding of local indigenous knowledge and perspectives uh, and to take the time to nurture the relationships with people who've called the place um, that you call home for millennia. Uh, so we'd encourage you to consider what you could do to deepen your understanding. And we invite you now to share in the chat what indigenous territories you're joining us from this evening, if you are indeed joining uh, from a place uh, with First Nation territories. And hi everyone, my name is Farheen. I'm joining you from the Take Me Outside team and on behalf of our organization and our 27 outdoor learning partners, we're really excited to welcome you all and be here this evening. I'm joining you from the traditional territories of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people um, here in Toronto, aka Richmond Hill area. Um, taking the silver lining from the last two years, we're really excited to be able to offer these workshops virtually, enabling those across Canada and beyond to join us, especially those who are in remote areas or populations that are underrepresented, because it's more fun when we can all get together and share our mutual desire for outdoor learning. Okay, thanks. And for everyone just joining us, uh, welcome. We're going to do a couple of quick polls to get an understanding of who's with us today. Um, Zoom 101, pretty sure everyone knows, but you can hit the button top right that says view with some dots and change the speaker. And we're going to have a presentation up uh, and you can have your video on or off, whatever suits. Um, we're going to have a presentation, a Q&A and then some prizes. Um, the workshop will be recorded and you will have access to a certificate of attendance. So here we go. First poll though, where are you joining us from? So I know we just did our land acknowledgement waterfall, but this gives us a general idea of some territories. You can scroll down to make sure uh, we've got 108 participants and we are almost there. 83% have participated. I'll give it another five, four, three, two, one. I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So um, we're looking at Ontario as, as the sort of front liner there and some BC, some friends down from across the border. Um, oh, but hadn't somebody from outside of Canada and the United States, we've got some representation across the board. That's fantastic. And we've now got another one. So we know where you're from, but who are you and what do you do? We'll just take a few seconds there to get an understanding of who is coming to join us. Again, every single category is uh, being represented as they fill in here. I'll give it another five seconds. Three, two, one. And let's share those results. Okay, quarter of people are early educators, K to three, four to eight, some community educators, some 
admin or support roles and something else exciting. Well, I'm so pleased that we've got um, an amazing array uh, of people to join us. So uh, the Canadian Outdoor Learning Full Virtual Workshop Series is brought to you by a group of um, over 25 partners from across the country, which offer excellent outdoor and environmental education resources, programs, support. So I'm going to just run through their names uh, and Farheen is going to put some links in the chat. And in fact, I'm going to just share with you... Um, who we are. So again, welcome to Game of Groans. Winter is coming with Dave Quinn, uh, who's our outdoor educator extraordinaire. We are Canada's outdoor learning store and Take Me Outside. Our partners, uh, Take Me Outside, the Pacific Foundation for Understanding Nature Society, Ecom, Green Teacher, Green Learning, Natural Curiosity, Wild Sight, Geoc, Sask Outdoors, Ace, Stoked on Science, Get Outside and Play, OC, Classroom to Communities, KB, Learning for a Sustainable Future, Imagine Ed, Eco Schools Canada, OceanWise, and Project Red Canada too. So that's it. We have people from coast to coast. If you're looking for resources, they're on our website and uh, you can follow any of those links that speaks to you. So I'm going to get right to the meat and potatoes here. Uh, joining us today for an expert presentation is Dave Quinn. He's a wildlife biologist, ACMG guide, outdoor educator uh, and certified teacher. He's based in Kimberley. He's designed, consulted for, currently runs numerous outdoor educational programs um, across the Columbia Basin and beyond, including the Know Your Watershed program administered by WildSite. Um, I don't think I've ever met someone with more passion for wilderness and wildlife um, and somebody who's working incredibly hard to connect uh, the next generation to the world-class wild we have in Canada and protect it for the future. So I'm going to stop my share there and uh, invite Dave to take the stage um, while he gets sorted with uh, his setup there and sharing his screen. Again, just remind you, uh, type any questions into the chat. Um, video on or off works. Uh, we're going to collect all of those um, chat questions and then pose them at the end. And um, yes. That should be that. All right, Jason, one second here. I'm just about no there. We are uh, somewhat live there. Indeed, yeah, I can see it. Mm. All right. Um, well, thank you very much for uh, for joining us, everyone. We've got, uh, I noticed some folks from Vermont and uh, Yukon and all over the place. These, I'm always amazed at uh, how much these zoom presentations can can bring us together i've you know very i'm very anti-tech and uh in general uh, try to avoid as much as i can but there's a lot of incredible benefits um for it so just before we get uh get get too deep in just um husukni which uh, just means thank you in the tanaha language and that's the territory that i'm lucky enough to have been been born into um, in uh, to Tanaka Amakas, which is the home, homeland of the, the, the Tanaka, Tanaka folks. And uh, I'm actually joining you today from the, the neighboring territory. I'm over in Pakani, the Pakani Nation Blackfoot Confederacy uh, territory, just over in Blairmore by the, by the Frank Slide. Um, and uh, it's very windy over here. And it's uh, nice to get a, a little bit of winter because we haven't really had, it's kind of, a, kind of uh, an interesting time to be doing a, a, a winter outdoor education program. So um, obviously you can't, mention or do a winter program i guess uh without you know talking about game of thrones if you're into sci-fi and that kind of stuff um and it's uh you know i just would like to start with a little moment of silence and it ties a little bit into some other projects that i'm, I'm working on as well um my daughter and i this is this is on sunday and um we had a really nice uh snowfall in, in kimberly where i'm from and but this is the shortest lived snowman that i've ever seen so this is at about um you know 10 o'clock in the morning and then by one o'clock in the afternoon um it had been raining so hard that uh, our poor snowman had, <laughs> had become a a victim of of climate change and it's it's really interesting because obviously i think people have probably heard what else happened in the province that day with um that incredible atmospheric river that 
you know, blew out bridges and culverts and railways and highways and people are still stranded in, in all kinds of places. So just, um, yeah, just a little moment of thanks if you're not in that situation and appreciation for being in a place where, you know, you don't have those challenges. But in the end, we're all sort of in this big kind of climate challenge. And, and another, another program that I'm working on um, is uh, kind of trying to create a curriculum for British Columbia and the teacher in Revelstoke, Sarah Newton, kind of came up with the idea and her and Naomi Ford have kind of taken over um, kind of the next steps on it. But how it relates to this is it just this appreciation for winter, um, this celebration of winter. Um, Wayu Namu is, uh, is the Tanaka name for winter is, is just such a really key part of helping young people um, you know, understand why one of the reasons that, you know, fighting climate change and, and why, uh, why we need to start thinking about some of these uh, of these things. So celebrating winter is just such a neat uh, portal into that, you know, heavy, potentially heavy discussion. Um, one of the ways that I've been lucky enough to, you know, celebrate winter over my career, I'm working with WildSight uh, mainly, and I, as, as Jade mentioned, and thanks for that, that incredible intro, Jade. Um, the, uh, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of different groups and some incredible educators and, and mentors and, and um, you know, people who are peers that I've learned tons from. And one of the things I got to do for years is to dress up as Captain Powder. And uh, that's, that's my Captain Powder outfit there with a, um, an, the outdoor uh, forest kindergarten class from Cranbrook. So every Wednesday we would kind of connect and, and um, do a whole bunch of activities and obviously spring activities, fall activities. This is a, this is a, a winter shot here. So this whole idea of, you know, getting into winter, celebrating winter is, um, you know, there's so many different ways of doing it. This is sort of one of what has been one of my, one of my favorites. And I just think, you know, pretty much everywhere that people are checking in from has somewhere between three months and six months of winter. And this is kind of behind my house in, in Kimberley. This is the Purcell Wilderness Conservancy, the Leaning Towers in the background there. Um, one of the things I like to do every year to celebrate winter is go on a big ski tour. So just put a big pack on and go walk in the walk in the mountains for you know five to ten days. It's kind of been closer to five days now that I have have kids and everything, but um, try to get as much as I can. But you know, up in these high mountains, it's you know six months or more of winter. A lot of our mountain towns winter can start in November and December, January, February, March. Uh, into April is, you know, five, six months of winter for, for a, a lot of, of Canada and Northern North America. So it's kind of a neat thing to, you know, we like to complain about it a lot for some reason. A lot of people do. It's kind of in our, in our psyche, but it's also something to celebrate and something that may, sets us apart from a lot of the rest of the world. I would have such a, I, I think I'd probably be able to enjoy parts of it, but this places in the world where they have a wet season and a dry season or a hot and dry season and a hot and wet season. You know, I love our four seasons and winter is just such an, an incredible one. It's super beautiful. Um, this low light we have right now is, uh, is a pretty special opportunity to, you know, curl in, cuddle in, celebrate things that happen in the dark. I've got some night sky guides we're gonna talk about that are available at the Outdoor Learning Store. Uh, and it's just lots, lots to, 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 to celebrate. Um, one of the things about winter is just, a lot of the things that we don't see for the rest of the season, uh, animals, animal tracks and things like that are really more visible. Um, so some of our animals do disappear. They kind of go into hibernation or, or migrate, but a lot of the animals that stick around are a lot more visible in the winter times because a lot of them move down to the valley bottoms where humans have set up our permanent settlements in the last couple hundred years. So it's a neat opportunity to engage with wildlife, to, you know, turn on all kinds of switches with kids. And I noticed in the, um, who's joining poll there pretty heavily weighted to you know that k to eight um educator range and so that's got a lot of what i'm going to talk about today kind of pertains to that with a few a few notes about kind of older uh, grades as well but this is um this is another winter wonder program here and we've kind of got a sheet that uh, a lot of our educators have drawn tracks on because you know sometimes the snow conditions aren't perfect you don't always get ideal tracking sometimes you do and it's incredible, but even if you don't, it's really neat to kind of set out this sheet that has all these tracks drawn on it, connect it with pictures of the animals that made the tracks and, and uh, help connect kids that way to the, the signs that, that they're seeing out there. The other thing I, I find really fun with kids is, is, uh, is going out with a purpose. And um, you know, there's all sorts of ways you can do that in your cities, your towns, your, your rural areas. Um, in, in the part of the, uh, 
Canada that I live in, we've actually lost um, a lot of our, we are losing a lot of our species that rely on old growth forests because the, there really aren't <laughs> any left, unfortunately. So we lost uh, mountain caribou um, a couple of years ago. We actually captured the last few cows, the females, and flew them up to the the herd a little farther north. Um, and so what, one of our caribou from the Kootenays ended up in the Calgary Zoo. And so that's a neat, really fun thing for kids in, in our area is to go out and actually collect lichen, which is what these kids are doing here. Um, and the, the caribou use the snow as a platform with their giant feet and actually get up and eat this uh, arboreal lichen out of the trees. And so the caribou that's in the zoo doesn't really have a chance to eat its normal uh, diet. And so we actually go out and collect big piles of lichen for, uh, for this caribou. And um, Kirby is his name because he was found in Kirby Creek. So it's kind of just getting out there with with purpose is kind of a neat, a neat, a neat way of doing things. This is obviously a little bit beyond you know your your younger grades. This is one of the high school programs I work with. This is Lee Cormier's um, outdoor skills crack class at Mount Baker High School in Cranbrook. And and Cranbrook's really close to Kimberley, the southeast corner of British Columbia. We're kind of in the Rocky Mountains and the Purcell Mountains, lots of snow. The Purcells are known for deep, deep snow packs, so up to three meters of snow. And we also have Canada's highest year-round highway. And so it's a really neat opportunity for our students to get up into this deep snow belt, see what three meters of snow looks like. So if you're sitting in a room right now, your ceiling is probably a little bit under two meters and so you can basically do one and a half times the ceiling of your room that's how much snow is on the ground in the, in the Purcell Mountains so it's neat to get up and really explore that with kids we do some winter camping and some snowshoeing trips and things like that um, and obviously the weather's not always sunny and and great and winter presents a really interesting uh, challenge with that I think that's one of the reasons why we you know, shy away from it a little bit especially with larger groups of, of kids is that it can be a bit daunting as to how you how you manage kids and a group when you have sideways snow and snow you know look at these people's heads basically the snow is piling up centimeter by centimeter by centimeter if you stand still you'll you'll be buried and uh so managing these things can you know can can be really uh, a bit of a challenge one of the neat things is you really don't have as many wildlife issues to worry about um a lot of our cutie towns we still do these deer have kind of moved into town and they can the, the bucks this is this is a male deer called a buck they're not really that dangerous they're just kind of big and dopey and, and um, they fight each other during what's called the rut in the fall. But other than that, they're, they're pretty happy to just ignore you most of the time. Uh, sadly, there's a bunch of people who are still feeding the deer and it can get a bit sketchy around schoolyards because they associate people with food. And that's what this buck is doing is coming over to this group of people looking for food. Um, and it's actually the does, which are the female deer that we need to worry about more in, in the springtime when they have their fawns, they're really aggressive. But uh, that's kind of one thing to kind of keep in mind, just if you do, you know, bump into wildlife on your on your programs and maybe not as much of an issue in the bigger centers that you might be joining us from. But in some of our rural towns, you know, bumping into coyotes, bumping into um, deer. I've got um, the last two weeks, I've had a, a bear sleeping in my tree in front of my house every every day, all day. It comes down at night and does its thing and then heads back up. And so you just got to think about it a little bit. Um, you know, the bears are still out if you're in a rural area and uh, they're you know, kind of going into the dens for a little bit and coming back out. And if it gets really cold, they'll go in for a few days, but they'll be out in a boat until uh, the middle of December, usually around here. Um, up in the mountains, they like have probably started to go in. The grizzly bears have kind of gone to their dens for the most part. And the little black bears are still, Nupku is the black bear, Khalfa is the grizzly bear. They're still out in a boat a little bit. Um, I was really lucky to spend a good chunk of my um, my 20s and 30s guiding big trips and uh, big two week expeditions in pretty wild parts of the world. And, and uh, it seems to be the, the way of it is that the really wild parts of the world are the parts that are really hard to get to. And um, that's why people aren't settled there and haven't kind of taken over. So I got to, you know, work in the Arctic and Greenland and, and uh, you know, Great Slave Lake. This is a, a hike we would do in uh, southern Argentina and Patagonia. But as a guide, you're, you're responsible for other people. It's not very dissimilar from looking after a, a group of kids. And, um, you know, you really have to, you know, make sure that's safe, make sure they're learning something, make sure they're, make sure they're having a good time. Um, and, you know, some of the lessons that, that, that come out of it are just from experience. And so this is a, a big kayaking trip. Um, we, we would do these kayaking trips up in, our, in Ellesmere Island. There's a couple of fjords up there that don't really ever freeze solid. The currents just are so big, they're called polinias. And so they melt out pretty reliably in the summertime. We'd fly up there and do these big two-week kayaking expeditions. But if the wind ever came up, it would do this. It would 
pound the ice into the shore, pile it up, and we'd end up having to carry our kayaks over these headlands and try to find open water and everything. And, and the lessons that you get from being outside yourself and managing a group of people is are pretty priceless. And so I guess that's one of the me messages today is uh, is if you're outside um, and you want to get your classes outside, make sure you get outside a lot. Uh, make sure you get outside on the weekends and, and push yourself. And you don't have to do things as extreme as this. This is a a river called the Thompson River on uh, Banks Island, which is Alavik National Park. And it gets about 20 visitors a year, this, this park. It's, uh, Banks Island is the biggest Western Arctic island in, uh, in the Canadian High Arctic. And um, we'd show up about the same time every year, kind of late June, and this river would be flowing and melted out. And then we showed up one year and it was solid ice. And uh, this, uh, this idea that winter, you know, in the Arctic, if you're in the higher latitude, someone who was joining us from the Yukon probably sees winter into, you know, May, early June some years and, and can show up at any at any point. So um, just spend time outside. This is this is this is high to go. So get get, you know, stretch, stretch your limits a little bit, um, toughen up your skin a little bit, you know, just get uh, get some experience where you're not as stressed about your comfort levels. And, and when you're trying to get your get your students outside. So like one of the obvious lessons is, especially when you got little kids, is uh, seek sun and hide from the wind. And so little kids can cool off really quickly. And even if they're dressed well, it's, um, you know, you get a minus 10, minus 15 day. Um, if it's not windy, it's minus 15, minus 18, yeah, minus 20. It's not windy. You're going to be doing doing fine going out for, for a little bit if it's sunny. Uh, if the wind comes up, it changes things. I'm where I am today, it is uh it was about minus five or minus six or eight or something this morning, but it was howling wind. This part of the world, um Pincher Creek area, um southern Alberta is known for incredible winds. There was there was wind warnings on Monday and Tuesday, 100 kilometer an hour winds. Um they were worried about trucks blowing off the highway sort of thing. Um, when you have you know any wind in the equation with cold it does make things a bit more serious so this is what we do guiding is we you know we try to find spots where we stop to, that's out of the wind and find spots where we uh, take breaks that are that are that are in the sun and that's sort of a, one of the easy easy things to do um, and I just also as mentioned having that that sort of theme and so this this is a bunch of high school students pretending to be caribou and we do a lot of uh, um, using caribou as, a, as a, a keystone species to study, to learn about winter ecology, to learn about snow. And, um, you know, when you, when, you, when you get out with your classes, you just have something to focus on. Uh, some of this, I know there's probably a whole range of experience levels in the, uh, in, in, in the Zoom room today. And uh, so these are just kind of some easy tricks to just think a little bit about when you're getting your classes outside. And one of the easiest ones is bridging the classroom and the outdoors. So just find things that your kids are used to in your classroom setting. It might be the way, the way they sit, might be circling up in classroom. You can transfer that outside. Um, they might have a journal in class that you can take outside. Maybe you can uh, use clipboards inside and take, take those outside. That Just that all of a sudden kind of normalizes things. And it's not a very crazy thing to be going outside if you're kind of doing the same types of activities as you're doing inside. Um, this, a lot of the younger students, younger classes I work with, there's some incredible teachers out there, and they're just basically picking one spot, either close to the school, the back corner of the schoolyard, in the park across the way, or down the block, um, you know, and just getting to know it. And the students kind of take some ownership over it, get super comfy in that zone, find their sit spots, find their little spirit spots, and it just makes it theirs. And kind of, uh, again, helps get rid of that separation between humans and nature that is so bizarre that how separated that, that we've that we've become and so that kind of familiarizing you know is good for you as the educator you've got less variables to worry about you're going to be way more comfortable out there your kids are the same um, and don't be worried about pushing comfort zones uh, it's amazing how much we kind of protect our kids and protect our students and worry about this going sideways and obviously there's there's variables in every classroom there's students in every classroom that have some serious limitations that you need to need to factor in but if you've got a safe setting you've some predictable familiar zones you're going to then you can you can push things a little bit and I'm always amazed that um, I've been to schools where if it's minus 15 we can't go outside we're going to have an inside recess and it's like well it's minus 15 and sunny and there's no wind it's actually pretty beautiful outside it's really really nice and and um, there's a big chunk of the planet that if they didn't go outside when it was minus 15 they wouldn't go outside for months and um, and so I think this being okay in your schools and your classrooms to, to push your comfort zones a little bit is 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 okay 
uh, and the trust your students. So uh, I'm, I'm just reading this here, like why freedoms is in, is in quotes there. I'm not sure it seems a bit ironic, but um, just to give uh, your kids freedoms within safe boundaries. So that risky play idea, just, just be okay with, with them, you know, pushing things a little bit. That's kind of what helps them grow as, as students. Um, this, this is from my, my family's photo file. And this is, I was mining my father's, my late father's um, uh, slides for a different project. And I came across all this stuff and he worked at a, organization called Outward Bound, which I think probably some people are very familiar with back in the 60s in Carameas. And there's all these photos of, you know, young kids fly, flying around, just risky play, the ultimate risky play. And some of them, I was kind of shocked. You know, this, this guy's rappelling down a, <laughs> down a cliff, no helmet, no harness, an old hemp rope, big, uh, big grin in his face. And, um, you know, this is obviously not acceptable anymore. This is sort of, this is the way it was done back then. And there's been a lot of really uh, tragic things that have happened over the years that have, you know, come up with safety guidelines for a reason. And so um, this idea that we need to push our students to the maximum is it's that fine line of like pushing them a little bit, trust them, let them have some risky play, but um, you've also got to kind of use your sense of not self-preservation, but student preservation as well. And one of the, one of my mentors, um, Brian Conrad is a teacher at uh, Mount Baker school when I was, when I was working there. And he had this, this concept that I'm not sure where he got it from, but um, it's called the perception of wilderness. And so we would do these programs where we would hike our students in for like three kilometers through the bush, you know, following compass bearings. And it would feel like we were going on this, this epic to the middle of nowhere. And little did they know that there was actually a road, like a, a logging road that was, you know, a couple hundred meters through the woods beyond where we had stopped. And um, so they felt like they were in the middle of nowhere, but we had a really easy way to get someone out if they were hurt. We had, you know, a way to, you know, get supplies in if, if needed this this photo here is up at Kootenai Pass again again Canada's highest year-round plowed highway and uh you know it's these students have just snowshoed in they've taken a bus way up but there's a highway right there and it's a two kilometer road easy way to get someone out on a toboggan if you need to and so they feel like they're in the middle of nowhere and they've conquered the world and they're about to be on top of Everest um but really you know it's 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 a very padded perception of of, of wilderness and that you can you can have this in a in a in a urban setting in a rural setting you, know, you can hike your kids into the big city park and um you know go to the very back corner of it and they feel like they're in the middle of nowhere and this is it's one of the snow studies that we do some of the avalanche programs that i teach we just go to the local ski hill and just go off to the back uh, or off to the side of the local ski hill and, and there's deep snow there's no tracks no one's been there feels like they're we're in the middle of nowhere but um you know it's a two minute walk from a, a parking lot some shoveling practice here doing our shoveling scenario that's another photo of uh, this multi-class thing so it's kind of neat when you do have the opportunity to do outdoor events in the winter time that really you know let classes work together and you have some older classes younger classes and this is a, a big one of the big lichen collections that i was mentioning those big mounds are actually lichen that these these students have collected for uh, for endangered caribou uh, one of the other lessons is, is keeping them moving. And there's all kinds of cool games out there. This is snowflake tag. And, and sometimes you play line tag in the gym um, where the kids have to run on the line. So they'll probably be familiar with this. That's a kind of a cool bridge to get them from the inside to the outside. And so in the gym, you're not allowed to step off the lines. You got to stay on the lines. And in the winter, you can still get them to stomp out, follow you around, stomp out a snowflake shaped um, course. And you can make someone be a lynx put a, some lynx ears on them and the rest of them are snowshoe hares or someone could be a, a swaw, a, a cougar and the rest of could be chipka, uh, which, which is the Tanaka name for deer. Um, and you can do whatever sort of links that you think uh, are relevant to your, your units that you're working on. Um, it's good to be reminded how much we should celebrate snow. And uh, it's, it does make life challenging in Canada when it starts to snow and blow and melt and, and we have to shovel it all the time. But I was super lucky to do a partnership with CEDA with um, the National College of Tourism in, in Tanzania. And so I, I got to go there with a colleague to help them set up a, um, a, a you know, a, a sea kayaking industry. It's essentially, they have a thousand kilometers of, you know, sandy, beautiful tropical beaches and they didn't have really any kayaking going on. So we were trying to work with the National College of Tourism to set up a program to train some of their their folks to uh, to be able to put these programs on, and in return, they came and visited us to kind of see what sort of things we do. And this is Zawadi, and this is Zawadi's like first time ever 
seeing snow and and i still look at this photo and it just makes me just realize how wonderful this, this stuff is this white beautiful stuff that sits on the ground and you know piles up and you can make snowballs and you can sit in it and you can do all kinds of all kinds of neat things and then obviously the you know making snow fairies and and snow butterflies or whatever however you want to label these things um is you know, a very very fun thing for everyone to do forts every time you got a crust on the snow once it kind of warms up and cools down and freezes a, a few times or just if you've got some deep snow or you've got enough snow to move around um i once taught a um a winter survival course at thunder bay university i taught there for a year in the outdoor recreation parks and tourism program and we had i think about an inch and a half of snow and so the, and the kids had to build quinzies which are sort of the eastern eastern first nations um uh, snow shelter which involves making a pile of snow jumping on it putting a bunch of energy into it letting it sort of center up into a kind of solid form and then you hollow it out and they had basically used tarps to gather snow from a football field <laughs> to make one giant quinzy and so there's all kinds of ways just because you have very little snow or not much snow it doesn't mean you cannot uh, cannot have, have some fun with it and here's a here's a good example of a of a quinzy here so just the snow is piled up and it's a neat thing to do with with your students and if you do want to do this sort of stuff you just really need to just you know research it a little bit um it's a good look at physics it's a good look at structure so you really need that archway structure and you can link it back to the you know roman aqueducts and all that sort of you know things that are standing a couple thousand years later because they were built well and so you'd need that really good archway on the inside or you know you do have some risks of uh, of collapse but as long as it's built well they're they're, they're pretty solid uh, so looking closely, and I've got a couple of products from the um, the outdoor learning store. I'll show you at the end here, uh, just just to understand how magical snowflakes are. This idea that a speck of dust, you know, gets stirred up by a camel stampede in Asia or something, flies across the Pacific, or you know, comes from the south, depending on where you're getting your weather systems from, and and slowly has this build up of rhyme on it is build up of ice that makes these magical shapes. And have, helping kids understand that is such a neat way of doing it. Um, if you have enough snow to move around or to dig into, uh, get your kids into it. Uh, we we this is one of the most enjoyable times of any program I do with young kids. Is we make elk beds. Gethli uh, is is elk in Tanaka, and uh, you know, that's how they survive a big blizzard. You know, minus thirty and blowing is they basically just gouge out a big bed in the snow and like everything else, curl curl up and get get blasted in. And so if you can make a bunch of beds for your kids and then kind of bury them, go around and help them bury them. You're going to have about 10 minutes of quiet and peace. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty amazing how warm these snow beds actually are. It's a good link to, um, you know, uh, thermal concepts and kind of how, how insulating snow is and that subnivian layer, that whole, you know, community of things that are living under this snow, using it as a blanket to survive. And the kids get that when they, you know, it can be minus 10, minus, 12 out and they get buried in the snow and it's like well this is actually warm some of them actually fall asleep it's, it's, it's pretty fun um color color is such a fun way to uh, to explore so this is a, a class i taught for a, a year at a local school and uh we were celebrating um Koli, the, the indian festival of, of of color and and you can use everything from just um i think we were using kool-aid crystals for this <laughs> this activity um, but the other thing is, is just to get a, a pressurized spray bottles and food coloring. So it's non-toxic and it, uh, you can make snow sculptures and decorate them. You can make messages in the snow. This is um, a much better use for, I think these things are designed, this little green thing that's in my daughter's sled behind her is, I think it's designed for spraying pesticides and, and um, herbicides and things. So this is a, a way better use for it. And you can um, just get one of these at the hardware store and you can pressurize it up and make all kinds of fun designs in, in, in the, in the snow. And my kids love it. And I use these in, in a lot of my winter programs. Uh, the other time it's been useful. And, and if you are in a place that doesn't get much snow, you'll find that your schoolyard turns into like a sea of basically almost a skating rink within you know, a couple of days of a few hundred kids rolling around in it. And so if you don't have the snow to pack down to make snow, patterns or to make um snowflake tag then you can use this to kind of spray out a labyrinth i've, I've actually made a there we did a celebration of carnival um at, at a school and i made a, a big uh, maze like a, a big labyrinth with this one so there's all kinds of applications for color and spritzers in 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 the snow and this is this is one of the most fun ones that i've ever done that people from this part of the world will understand this this for 30 years we kind of fought for a big 
the whole area really was kind of fighting a, an Italian developer wanted to build a city um, right in the middle of the Purcell Mountains, kind of near where we live in between Invermere and, 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 and Kimberly. And we have, you know, 19 ski hills within a five hour drive and all of which were kind of on the edge. And we're like, well, don't really want to destroy this incredibly beautiful mountain spot and put all of our ski hills at risk by putting another big ski hill into the middle of it all. And so we, a bunch of us kind of heard that there were some French investors to come and they were coming to fly around a helicopter to look at, <laughs> at this potential ski hill. So a bunch of us went up in the middle of the night on snowmobiles and painted all these uh, jumbo wild and, you know, grizzlies, not gondolas messages all over the snow. So there's all kinds of uses for, um, for spritzers. Uh, the other thing is forts. Yeah, kids love building. Kids love creating. And, you know, whether you're using sticks and found objects, you could do this any time of year. It's not necessarily just a, a winter activity, but the snow component just makes it so much more cozy. And, and especially that kindergarten to grade six level, they just, they'll move into this and, and take it over and, and love it. Get weeks of weeks of play out of it. And this is, this is a, actually a winter program here in, in Creston. So Creston's a bit lower. Um, where I am up in Kimberley, we are, I think at about, um, I'm trying to remember where we where we are. We're probably like 17, 1500 meters, something like that. And Crescent's down at 500. And so it's, uh, it's you know, two, uh, a thousand meters lower. And uh, so it often gets a lot of rain when the rest of the Kootenays are getting s snow. And so if you don't have the snow, you've got to kind of shift to the objects that are at hand, sticks. And fire this is one of the things I, I, I love doing fire programs with, with kids. And so I do a bunch of kind of survival scenarios and, and again, give them the, the purpose for the day is to, is to try to figure out, you know, how to get what you need to, to survive. So shelter, water, and, 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 and fire is, is part of that challenge. And a lot of classes and teachers are a little bit nervous around fire. And, and for me, I think this is where the trust comes in and where you give the kids the freedom to do their own thing and to take some risks and to have a, you know, a really memorable day and so that's for me the biggest risk of, of fire um is getting a bunch of you know spark holes in really expensive jackets and so you kind of got to manage that a little bit and the stick thing is another thing people are kids are always poking sticks in fire and i kind of have that as a pretty basic rule like there's no sticks going in fire and then getting waved around but that's really the one thing that you need to kind of you know worry about the, the the horsing around the horse play kids figure it out and um you know you obviously have we'll probably have some kids you have to monitor a little bit but most of them get it pretty 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 well and again with the freedoms you're always amazed as an, as an educator i've had this program and um you know this a girl showed up with flint and steel and it's not something i ever would have expected you know a grade five to be able to start fire with with flint and steel and yet she did and uh, it was a it was a challenge we all kind of had to work together to help her out and everything and we eventually got a got a fire going with the old old school flint and steel and that's this kind of learning the kind of experience and celebration that comes when you do give your kids that trust and that uh that freedom to to push things a little bit and you you know you don't cancel a winter day when it because it's a little bit maybe a little bit too cold or a little bit too too um too too wet out and uh obviously there's you know different schools different districts will have different policies uh, i know a lot of schools in in the district that i work in anything below minus 20 they're not they, they like to have indoor recess for sure and indoor lunch but again i think it should be sort of a well it's minus 20 and beautiful sunny day you gotta let these kids run you gotta let them outside for even five or ten minutes they're not they're not gonna you know get frostbite and in five minutes if, 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 if there's no wind. Um, if it's minus 20 and blowing, that's a whole other story for sure. So when I get, Namu is the, the Tanaka word for, for, for winter and it's, it's here, it's trying to come just despite all the crazy challenges and, and the, the rain events that we've been having and these warm temperatures and melting events. Uh, it's here and it's here for you know, another you know, four or five months depending on, on uh, where you are in, in Canada or the States. And, and I, I really do hope that, you know, you've something that we went over briefly here helps either motivate you or um, support you or just encourage you to try a few different things outside. I'm going to stop uh, my screen share now, Jade, if that's okay. Absolutely. Come on back. And um, I was going to encourage you to turn your video on while you were chatting, but the pictures were pretty absorbing and your voice was just fine. There we go. Um, I, I, I thought it was on all these funny little gremlins. So I think I'm off the screen share. So 
You're off your screen share, but still uh, awesome. there you are. That's funny because I'm on screen share. This little, little message just came up now that I'm back on Zoom. It says your host has asked you to start your video. So uh, here we nice. are. Um, so yeah, anyways, I've, I've, I've got on some like, I've got my, I busted my winter wonder snowflake scarf out for the, for the presentation today. I figured if we're going to talk about winter. I also, this is another kind of essential tool for anything outside. I think most educators know this, but just having a whistle. Um, you know, for folks like uh, Jade and I, we're doing this all the time. Just it saves our voice for one, and just having these easy codes that again help you build that familiar setting of if your kids know if it's one whistle, they need to zip it. If it's three whistles, they need to come back to me right away. And that can be just a transition tool, or it can be yeah, something's going on. There's a you know an animal they're worried about, or we someone's you know had a bit of a slip, or something. We got to get everyone back together, um, and you can make up whatever you want for for two whistles. You got to turn around three times. Uh, other optional tools. So someone back in the day, a long time ago, gave me this lovely moose poo necklace. Um, and uh, this is lacquered uh, um, moose, moose turds. And so how this links to winter is that, you know, moose are one of these species that sticks around and adapts to winter and they do super well. I actually saw uh, five, five, five moose today, actually, as I was out walking around. Um, it's so weird being in Southern Alberta here where it's kind of half edible forest and half grassland to see these giant critters running around in the in the grasslands but you know as a biologist is kind of one of my other jobs and we study poo a lot and so if you look at moose poo it's like compressed fiberboard and the reason for that is they're they're browsing twigs they're eating wood uh that's how they that's how they they survive the winters and so their their scat is just like compressed uh, sawdust and um, the other end of the spectrum is, is caribou. Caribou are very picky eaters and they are eating like flowers and the ends, ends of little things and soft lichen. And so their, their scat looks like little Hershey's Kisses, like nice and smooth and everything. So just that is a really neat lesson, of, despite being a kind of a funny necklace, there's some neat lessons that can be learned from, from the scat and the tracks and the other sign that we see out there. So I, I see a few questions kind of um, rolling in, but uh, before we do that, um, Duncan, who um, works with works with Jade and and Columbia Basin uh, Environmental Education Network, is uh, our executive director. Uh, sent me a, a bin of all kinds of cool stuff um, to kind of share from the outdoor learning store. And so I just encourage you, if you are looking for some tools that are going to help you get outside or to help kind of take your outside learning to you know another level, it's the outdoor learning store is, is incredible. So um, uh, journals, got to figure out where my camera is here about to put it in front of me because it doesn't work with the screen share. <laughs> um, I've got this funny background here. Um, so this is just, it's, this is right in the rain paper. And so your students can take these out and there are many, many pages of lined paper. So, you know, connections with language arts, connections with poetry, inspiration, you know, drawing things, whatever you want to do, and they're not going to dissolve in the rain. So this is kind of a cool thing. I mentioned, um, we'll see if this works. This is, uh, I hold it still maybe it'll show up um this is a, just these recycled uh, material clipboards and again helps you take that stuff that you're using in the classroom transfer it outside and the kids have got this physical item that can help them feel a little bit more relaxed out there uh we've got this awesome um large hand held uh, lenses and so we've got a bunch of uh smaller lenses that i, I have used and i haven't seen one that, that's this big these are actually nicer for little kids um the little ones are super easy to drop in the snow and get all you know covered in water once it melts and everything and so you put a little bit of flagging tape on here so if they do get dropped in the snow they're easy to find and a class set of these again useful not just in the winter for the whole, the whole season i mentioned the the sky chart and again with this yeah, shows up cool. Um, these laminated sky charts are really cool. And, and obviously we're not in school typically when it's dark, but it'd be a really cool thing. You know, it's, uh, what time is it now? It's, you know, 546, it's been dark for, you know, 45 minutes here in Southern Alberta, Southern British Columbia. And, uh, you know, that's one of the beauties about solstice this, this time of year is the really long, beautiful nights. And so the Northern lights show up sometimes and, and there's tons of great constellations on clear nights. So it'd be kind of some cool, things to send your kids with to like, yeah, see if you can find a couple of these uh, constellations and you can link back to the classical roots of some of them. And it's a neat way to, to engage kids. Uh, I'm sitting on this thing because it's so comfortable. Um, there's these version 1.0, see if it shows up, um, sit pads. And these are awesome for winter. 
So one of those bridges for getting a class of young people outside is just being able to sit like they've been taught to. And I'm so old school that it's sort of um, my learning was sitting in, a, sitting in a desk. A lot of our institutional learning is sitting in a desk still for, for better or worse. And it's, I'm really stoked. I see so many classrooms now that I go into that have beanbag chairs and bouncy balls and carpets. And it's, it's definitely evolving. But having an anchor somewhere to sit and be up off the snow, be warm is kind of a, a key piece of, um, you know, having some, some different activities outside. And if you want to step it up for your class, there is the, uh, the custom extra spongy, fully recycled material version of the sit pad as well. And so that's something that you could, um, you know, order, order for your class if you want to step it up. The other, there's a couple of books that uh, have some really great um, relevance. One is called uh, Dirty Teaching. So I can get a show there. Uh, and again, it's not just winter specific, obviously, but it's just got tons of, you know, guided activities and lesson plans, um, you know, for building forts, for um, just opening some random pages here, um, you know, life cycles of, 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 of animals and plants. So just this, this is awesome. It's just about taking some risks, having some fun, getting outside. Um, this book here, the big book of nature activities. Again, if you're looking for, I just disappear when I hold it up. There we are. Uh, the big book of nature activities is, is awesome. And I just, again, flipped through it. And the first page I opened to is just a, a bit of a reminder about why we're doing this stuff and why all these, why you've all signed up for this program tonight and, you know, why these organizations are so important. So this, the nature numbers for us to ponder is 2,500 is the number of advertising messages your child will encounter one day. 2,738 is the number of hours the average North American child sits in front of a glowing screen, like we are, <laughs> ironically, right now. 183, so, you know, less than, you know, 5% five, five of that, if I'm reading that right, um, maybe, maybe like 7%, is the number of hours a child spends outdoors in unstructured play every year. So that's another kind of message that I hope people maybe take away from, from today is just, you know, we are all very tempted to plan, you know, second day, the first second to the end, last second of our programs, leave some time, make sure you do leave some time, just play and your kids can explore and, and just have some fun out there. And that's when you'll see some of the magic actually happening. Um, and so there's just, just a few numbers. The other thing I opened up to, this one is structured by season. And so spring, fall, winter. Um, and so if you are looking for some winter specific activities, it's got a really incredible um, winter, winter, winter section to it. So that, that book, uh, where is it? The big book, it's just dis disappearing on my, <laughs> on my screen. The big book of nature activities is definitely uh, something that's worth investing in. Um, another kind of cool uh, thing that will help with some winter wildlife stuff is uh, we have these laminated animal tracking cards. And so again, there, you don't even need a class set you need, you know, one for two or three or four students and uh, just, just to head out and, and, and see what you can find. And, you know, it's not important the students get it right. And, um, you know, as I've, I've done a lot of tracking for, through some of the work that I do and it's, it, it, it's a whole different language, you know, just because you see tracks. And it's the one thing I learned is that this, when you see a track, it's not like, well, oh, that's obviously a, it's like, oh, what could that be? And you often have to follow the track for a while and see what kind of behavior that animal had, um, you know, to be able to say for sure what it is. Sometimes fox tracks and coyote tracks can be quite similar. And sometimes, you know, melted out, um, you know, coyote tracks that, you know, have been sitting in the sun could look like, like lynx tracks until you look at the pattern and everything. So they don't have to get it right. It's not what we're after with, with kids. It's just being curious and coming up with, with some theories and having a, a, a resource to kind of help them through that. So that's sort of, yeah, my kind of, um, you know, props to the outdoor, outdoor learning store. And it's kind of one of the things that kind of helps make these programs um, available and successful. It's, it's, it's part of the nonprofit. And so it's not something that's, um, you know, anyone sitting at home making money off of. It just really helps kind of get this kind of discussion going um, more and more. So I encourage you to check it out, outdoorlearningstore.ca. Thanks, uh, I, I, I do see some students coming in, so um, I just I don't have access to the chat, so I don't know if maybe 
one of you two could read out some stories, some there some questions. Definitely, definitely got a few stored up. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't write down names. Fahin's much better at this, but somebody asked, and a few people gave some examples. But um, what are some other fire food ideas other than marshmallows and hot dogs? Trying to work around allergies, for example. Oh, right on. Um, banana mellows is, is is first thing that comes to mind. So, um, you know, it's taking bananas, and it's not super obviously bioregional or anything like that. But um, I don't think marshmallows are either. And uh, but just cutting bananas into little cubes and Roast, roast the nose on sticks. They're so good. Or apples, um, you know, roast, roast apples on fire uh, are very, very good. It's kind of like making your own little, little apple pie. Uh, in terms of actual, you know, meals, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting one because it's just so easy to cook, 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 cook hot dogs on the, on the, on the fire for, for a large group. Um, I'll have to think about that one. I've got lots of little, little tricks. Anyway, maybe if people have some other ideas that, um, that, uh, May put Couple them in, in the chat, and then uh, one of us can 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 read about Bannock. I just saw Bannock come in on this uh, yeah. little a little note up in the corner. So, yeah, Bannock. Um, I make a. I lived in Norway for a bit, and they make snöbrö, which is snow bread, and it's basically just flour, water, a little bit of oil, and I imagine you could do it with gluten free flour if you had uh, gluten um allergies or intolerances and um you just make the dough at home the night before and it only needs one proof and then you get like a golf ball size you roll it and make a long sausage and then wrap it around a stick and then cook it over the fire and it puffs up and i normally take a jar of nutella if you've got nut allergies some other uh, sort of you can just eat it as it is but um dipped in nutella i think it might be one of the greatest things on earth um, yeah, just on this on this trip i was at on the coast we were in alert bay and um we uh went to, to duchess's bannock house and we had um you know I indian tacos and 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 bannock mcmuffins and you know Bannock they just they, bannock is the ultimate food and so i think there's just and it's such a such a neat link to um to traditional cultures and, and i think it's a that's that's a really great starting point and, and uh, you, could, you could take it take it wherever you want from there it's pretty cool so Dave Karuna asked, uh, hi, we're outside and we've got no snow in GA, USA. Um, Georgia? I'm not sure. Uh, my challenge is how to bring the classroom in different centers outside. So I guess perhaps just, um, yeah, some ideas in winter that aren't snow related. Yeah, well, I think that's, um, you know, the, the sheet idea that I showed you. So it, you don't have snow, but you kind of have that white sheet that represents snow with some of the animal tracks represented on it and you could get your students to, to make that um, it could be like a, a class project we're going to make our, our our snow tracking sheets and take them outside and see where we what kind of habitats we might find some of these 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 animals in um that's an interesting one so they, they i'm just kind of thinking as i go in terms of what you could do with bringing ice outside from uh you know ice cubes and things like that um and uh yeah, the other other interesting one is most most towns have an an arena, and I would want to look into this a little bit. But there's always big piles of snow behind the arena from the from the zambonis, um, and that might be kind of an interesting way of just getting some temporary snow to a school. Is just go grab a couple buckets of that and let, let the kids play with that. Make sure they wash their hands and they're done and everything. But just if you're in an area that has no snow but has an arena, you might be able to get some ice, so some snow. Okay, uh, Bernadine brings up a good point um, and says that um, haven't seen any kids in wheelchairs or other physically disabled students in your photos. Um, you could possibly put them in toboggans, but can you mention uh, how you've accommodated uh, special needs students? Yeah, so it's it's actually a little bit easier in, in winter, depending on your, um, you often have to you know, pick our destinations based on that. But most of the kids that we have in our schools that are in chairs all, are pretty used to getting into to toboggans for moving around the wintertime. Um, and so that's sort of a, a fairly easy adaptation. It's actually easier to get someone in a, in a, in a, in a toboggan than it is in a chair in, 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 in a lot of cases. Um, and, um, you know, some of the other sort of uh, challenges that we've had, like we have, we have a number of, of students who are visually impaired and hearing impaired and that sensory 
um, aspect of snow is awesome. You know, the cold and the different crunches. One of the things we do with uh, looking at different snow crystals is we dig down and we find the kind of rotten old sugary snow at the bottom and we actually crunch it and listen to it. And so that's a neat wave of, you know, people who are visually impaired. It's like, wow, that sounds totally different from the fresh powdery snow that we are mushing. It's just got a nice soft sound to it. So um, yes, yeah, so a re really good point. And it's really, um, it's, I think the thing that is the most adaptive there is just the destination. So if you have a, a plan where you're snowshoeing in a long ways, it's not going to work if you're going to have to, um, if you're going to, if you're bringing someone on a, on a sled or a toboggan, so you might have to do a shorter loop or something like that. So. Um, where I am, uh, yes, we don't have that many students that use wheelchairs, but when we have, we've gone to the local ski hill and there's generally a sort of bunny area and we've experimented with sit skis, uh, which is basically just a, a wheelchair bucket uh, on a ski and there are generally if you have that kind of facility people there who are trained uh, and will volunteer like we have a volunteer organization an adaptive sports program that will have people that can engage in that I'd say a big one um, from my experience and I feel like lots of other people um, those more with cognitive disabilities and actually I don't know Dave if you found that that outdoor learning is actually just the best classroom to be yeah it seems to kind of get rid of not not always obviously but just often it sort of gets rid of a lot of the challenges that those students have when they're expected to be in this very controlled environment all of a sudden the, the lid's blown off and uh <laughs> you know all the all my superpowers can come out so it's uh it seems seems to work pretty well uh, I, I just saw a little note about maple maple i think it was about maple syrup anyways i just saw something about boiling syrup um, down and and I think that's one of the things that is maybe not as recognized. You know, I, I make maple syrup at my house in Kimberley. We've got a few old maple trees that I tap, and I get about you know, you know, two or three liters of maple syrup every year. And I, every couple of years, I burn it at the last second, and I end up wrecking a big batch of it. But it, and it, it it takes a it it takes a long time to do. But it'd be a really cool uh, class project because you can order um, the spigots. Which I can't remember. There's a technical name for them. You just drill them and put them in, in into the trees and and uh and then you every day you have to be there anyways to collect collect the buckets of sap and then you know just have it boiling down in a the staff room or in a in, in a room that's you know not having a bunch of kids underneath boiling water um and just you know it's really it's a neat process and such a neat connection to eastern canada if you're living in the west um and that uh, that rich history of um of of what's on our you know, for better or for worse, on our on, on our flag is that that beautiful maple leaf, and it's kind of a neat a neat, neat connection. I saw another note about um, wildlife cameras too. Wildlife, there's a, I've worked with a bunch of schools uh, setting up wildlife cameras, even in the schoolyard. It's it's really cool. Even if you're incredibly downtown, uh, you'll be kind of amazed at what <laughs> what runs by your your school in the in, in the middle of the night. And um, you know, if you're like in a in a, in a very urban area there's obviously some theft issues like that but um you know we get cougars on them and, and deer and coyotes and skunks and um you know all, all kinds of surprising things walking by just on the edge of town right behind our our, our our schools and so it's that's a really neat way to kind of connect kids with um with 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 the natural world that's still out there in the winter time too a couple more questions before we close up here um Somebody asks, what's the best way to learn about more safety in the winter? Would a first aid or survival course be useful? Uh, it's interesting. I think if you circle back to that perception of, of wilderness, I think, you know, first aid, I think, is critical. Um, if you're taking students outside, it's just a critical piece of it. And so a lot of us have access to pro D funds. Um, I've I'm managed to kind of use some of my pro D funds with the district I work in as a substitute teacher at TOC um, to help pay for my annual first aid upgrades, or uh, skills upgrades, they call them. Um, so I, I recommend everyone get some kind of first aid training. That's just as a, as a, as a starting point. Um, but I, I, I think it's not really something that like the first aid is not going to really apply to risk management necessarily. And so I think it's, um, you know, finding mentors, finding people that you trust, finding people that have done this for a long time, um, you know, hiring people like Jade uh, or, you know, getting people like Jade or myself to come in and, and put on programs for your school or your staff to kind of um, look at some of the key things to be thinking about when you're planning trips. Um, and it kind of comes back to that, um, you know, proper preparation prevents 
really poor performance or whatever that whatever that acronym is. Um, but just that you know planning the right destination, factoring in. I don't need to take my students to the you know very back of the valley. You know I can get off the bus and go 100 meters into the woods, and it's going to meet the same goals for my program as if I get them into a place that has some higher consequences. Um, one thing I didn't mention is, you know, this is, I think, more fully understood now, but just, just in case, like anything to do with, um, you know, avalanche terrain, we just don't go into. Um, and so if, if it's not something, if, if, if avalanche terrain doesn't mean anything to you, um, it's just worth notice, noting that, you know, a, a good chunk of avalanche accidents, the victims or the people who survived them or the people who watched it, they said, I never thought that slope would avalanche they looked at it and were like, well, that's not avalanche terrain. And really, if all you need to have an avalanche is, you know, snow on a slope and, and, and a trigger, really. And uh, so if there's any question, you know, about where you're going with open slopes or anything like that, stay away from them. And if you want to know more, just get someone to come in who knows. There's tons of people that know a lot about avalanche safety and snow safety. Um, going to the ski hill, if you want to go into the mountains, is a, what we call a controlled environment. That's a great spot to get your students up into some deep snow and some really wild winter. Um, and just if you're not around a ski hill, just stay away from steep open areas. It's, it's just you don't want to take your kids into a situation where there's even a remote, minor, minuscule possibility of even a small avalanche. If you don't have the right gear, you know, it could be a tragic outcome. So things like moving water, things like avalanches, um, things like, um, you know, wildlife scenarios. You just want to have someone who knows what they're doing. And so a lot of the programs that we do, we have to hire you know, certified avalanche technicians or um, av avalanche instructors that sort of thing or, or, or guides or if you're doing anything on water you have to hire you know certified flat water canoe if you go on if you go on in a lake or if you're doing anything with white water with kind of older kids then you have to hire white water guides and so um, those are the things you know things that have high consequence are water and you know moving snow and so those are the kind of if you want to learn about anything you know, going on the Avalanche Canada website, avalanche.ca has got a little online avalanche course and just would give you a really quick tune up of like what is avalanche terrain and what what you definitely want to be avoiding with your class. And then if it's something that you're in, teaching in the mountains, living in the mountains, you should maybe take an avalanche course. That would be a, a good way to get rid of that variable. Um, and then the first aid piece is I think you should be working towards that and having that in your back pocket no matter what. That's the sort of thing that will increase everyone's confidence in you and you and yourself when you're out there if something happens no big deal I can figure it out um and um yeah I think those are those are the a few ideas anyways All right we'll have one last question and then we'll do our closing and prize uh and it's just uh Sarah asked when you're working with elementary students uh do you run into students that aren't dressed to be outdoors in cold weather how do you handle this oh uh, never everyone's <laughs> always totally prepared <laughs> so that's that's, uh, that's such an awesome question because it is it, and it's, it's funny because we're kind of just at the beginning of the um the winter season here so all these like experiences that um <laughs> there are almost every class there's a few students that already have the wrong boots and they don't really fit and so you just definitely um again with covid's changed a lot of things we used to just kind of mine the lost and found and we would just make sure we had extra gloves and extra mitts and, and you know, an extra, extra pair of boots sort of thing. There's always mountains of, of good clothes that are just sitting in the lost and found bin at the, at the school. Um, and that's the sort of thing I think to, to prime that, I mean, if you're an educator, I, I kind of prime the teacher that I'm working with just to kind of have a little extra bin. As a classroom teacher, just to have, just go to the thrift store and have a bin of extra mittens and extra warm toques and, and, and boots. You know, boots are, if, if you got, um, cold feet, you know, your day's kind of miserable, really. And uh, so if you can keep people's feet you get a little bit warm, and you always have kids' boots that fall off and fill up with snow. And um, it's just it's just part of the deal. And it, it's uh, if you can keep the fingers and the toes warm, then you're pretty you're pretty well set up. The, the other piece is the head, just kind of a, a saying that you lose, you know, 90% of your heat or whatever it is, 50% through your head. And so if you can keep people's heads and necks kind of nice and cozy, that seems to help them stay a little bit more comfortable too. Lovely. Um, yeah, all good points. Uh, and or ask, you know, do a clothes drive and ask each class to get one piece of clothing and add it to the bin or um, that's fantastic. Um, 
Dave, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your uh, wild and wonderful expertise around outdoor learning. Um, there's going to be a follow up email um, with links to some resources, um, a link to the recording and uh, an opportunity to get your certificate of completion. Um, please check your spam folders. We've discovered that some of them are going into the spam. So please have a look there if you don't get anything by tomorrow uh, lunchtime. Uh, it should be in there. And if not, uh, you can reach out um, via your registration email. My email's in there. You can just hit reply and it'll come to me. Um, okay, little prize. Now I'm going to make you work. I know it's late, um, but I just got inspired. And um, so I'm going to get you to have your typing fingers at the ready. If you would like to win a $50 um, gift card to the outdoor learning store, this might be pushing it. I've not done this before, but let's see. I was wondering the first person that can write me a haiku about winter. So that's five, seven, five syllables, three lines, five, seven, five, about winter. First one in $50, winter is great. I was looking for all three lines from one. Oh, I guess you've got to do. Um, yeah, everyone's hitting return and then it gets everyone's the, the first return. line. <laughs> ah! Amy, so just, just hit spaces in between your lines. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or slashes, I like that. It's my favorite. Okay. Oh, this is uh, this is tricky to monitor. Yeah, I need the whole poem. Winter is coming. Brace yourselves. Oh, hang on. For lots of fun, it's gonna be great. Oh, that's it, Sarah Grant. So <laughs> you go. made it beautiful oh, there's some lovely other ones i love winter lots winter is lots of fun woohoo winter can you come oh there's so many great ones jenny's cold frosty snowing fantastic um but sarah grant you were first in best dressed um dressed for the winter and um, please put put your email in the chat box for me and i'm going to send you your 50 dollar gift card to the outdoor learning store um, and thank you everyone for your beautiful poems. Uh, I'm going to copy them out of the chat and um, and look at them later for sheer joy. We could, we could create a, a, a winter poetry on anthology in our Take Me oh Outside. My goodness. Stop. And that's another thing, <laughs> right? Doing, doing poetry outside, doing nature art and doing one every season using found objects and seeing how that changes over time and colors and stuff anyway we've done the workshop i don't know too excited um i think farheen has a couple of little gifties to hand out too i do and dave speaking of the outdoor journals we have uh two to give up from take me outside and i'll put them in the chat since dave has said so many great things about them you can check them out yeah, yourself cool. um on our website but i was gonna pick two random winners but maybe we should just give it to the second and third person oh great idea, idea. now poetry should here. always be rewarded i think yeah okay so where was sarah's where was sarah's um, uh, leah snow falls gently now it is really amazing see i love white fluff stuff Ooh, oh i love that last line that's the only thing I like about winter. And Dave, your presentation was awesome. <laughs> it is cold outside. The wind is blowing too strong now. Time to go inside. Oh, not quite the right thing. I love winter lots. Oh, we're getting winter picky, are we? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I am, aren't I? Technical oh, oh, fun. I think, I think Leah Betcher, Leah Betcher and Maxine Koski. Great. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jade, for being my haiku checker. Um, Leah and Maxine, congratulations. Both of you win um, the Take Me Outside <laughs> Outdoor Weatherproof Journals. Um, and I've linked them in the chat for those of you who want to check them out. Uh, so Leah and was it Maxine, if you can just uh, send me an, um, a message with your email, I will be in touch and we'll get these mailed out to you. And thank you again, Dave, for the amazing presentation. Um, we had such an engaging crowd. So thank you to all, you all for watching and being part of it and <coughs> sharing your lovely insight. Uh, and last oh, point. Thank you. Yeah, Husukini to you, Dave. Um, last point, if you're looking for winter gifts, take me outside of doing toques now. Oh, um, cool. 
half merino, half acrylic. Again, non-profit, right? All the money goes back into making outdoor learning available uh, for more kids across Canada uh, and the world eventually. Um, that's uh, store.takemeoutside.ca. Um, all right, sales pitch done. Thank you so much for spending your evening or uh, afternoon with us. Uh, and thanks again, Dave. Um, it's always a pleasure. And Fahim for being superb uh, co-host. Uh, wishing you all a wonderful evening. Um, good night. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you.